First of all, I'd like to thank President Shapiro uh, for being here. Obviously a very busy person with lots to do, uh, which is good for us, uh, bad for him, but I'm very grateful that he's here. Um, I haven't seen Dan Linzer, but I think he's going to join us this afternoon, uh, later for dinner. Um, Vice President Jay Walsh, uh, Jay, thank you. Uh, and of course, Dean Mangelsdorf and Monica Rodriguez, um, since the college is instrumental in helping us bring Scott here, so I'd like to thank them as well. Um, and of course, I particularly would like to thank Bertie Buffett, because without Bertie Buffett, Elliot, we wouldn't be able to do these things. Um, so I want to take a few minutes to talk about what the Buffett Center has accomplished this past year. Uh, it's been, once again, a great year, as far as I'm concerned, and hopefully you agree. Um, just a few figures. Um, we have at present 150, actually 150 plus faculty affiliates. 60% are in the college, and 40% are from all the other schools. So we reach out to engineers and McCormick, journalism, uh, law school, business school. So we have a very diverse group, and we're trying to achieve this uh, interdisciplinary approach that, of course, has become the hallmark of Northwestern, and we're trying to do that in the International and Comparative Studies at Northwestern. Um, this past year, we've had 18 visiting scholars, uh, either directly through the center or through affiliated uh, sister organizations like the French Interdisciplinary Group, uh, DAAD, don't, don't, don't ask me to pronounce the whole thing. Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst. That's five years of German, I, you know, so I'm going to make that pay at some point. Uh, and of course, we have a modern Turkish studies program. So we had 18 visiting scholars. Uh, we have 12 working groups that bring together faculty, graduate students, and undergraduates. And many of you will have been part of these working groups. And again, trying to integrate across schools and across levels, undergraduate, graduate, faculty level. Um, we have nine different programs and centers that we work with. Um, FIG that I've already mentioned, of course, Program of African Studies, uh, ISITA, Institute for the Study of Islamic Thought in Africa, uh, which of course is closely related to what Scott is working on and Sani Umar is running, and Rebecca, I've seen Rebecca somewhere at the back. Um, okay, <laughs> Rebecca there as well. So it's a great program. So uh, it's, it's a real privilege for me at the Buffett Center to work with all of the programs and centers. Um, we also run roughly a dozen different undergraduate programs. Um, I could go on and on. I hope that you check out a website. But um, yesterday evening at length with, with Bertie and, and Dick and, and uh, Cynthia, we were able to talk about the Global Engagement Program, which has been one of the flagships. Um, this year, we will send 77 students um, out to call it developing nations. I don't know if that's the term anymore, but um, call them developing nations where the students work with undergraduate groups and, uh, and uh, NGOs uh, to look at development projects and try to put theory into practice in terms of the experiential learning experience that we're trying to inculcate with all our undergraduates across Northwestern, also fitting in with the, the strategic plan that we're trying to unfold as we speak. Um, Global Engagement Summit between Northwestern students and students coming in. We've had 120 undergraduates there. Uh, the Human Rights Group, I don't know if Chelsea's here today. She was there this evening. Chelsea, uh, Human Rights Group, 16 members strong, just about. Uh, fantastic group that also brings in uh, super speakers. Um, the Globe Med program, which Dan was here, because that program started with the provost office with one chapter, uh, which is now the national chapter and is the center of 50 other um, Globe Med programs across the country. So really something that's taken off and that um, was started here at Northwestern uh, at the Buffett Center. And I should mention that uh, Brian has been uh, a key player in making all of this happen. So uh, Brian, many thanks on my part. Um, also on the graduate research side, uh, we also sponsor graduate research fellowships and Bertie and I and Brian talked about it this morning. We will send about 35 graduate students into the field over summer uh, to start their dissertation work and as well uh, we try to help them at the end when, you know, this is the last chapter that you have to finish and you still need that little bit of field work done. That's where the Buffett Center can jump in as well. So we've got about 35 graduate students that we're supporting, again, across fields, performance studies, as we discussed, uh, but also across the social sciences, um, communications, and so on. So in all of this, the theme is interdisciplinary work, reaching across undergraduate, graduate faculty levels, trying to create a community, a community of scholars, community of students, community of faculty, where we're learning from our undergraduates. Um, the ones that I'm grading, uh, I'm done grading, I'm not teaching this quarter, so I can say it now, I'm done, but we're learning from you, okay? And that's truly an experience. I mean, I, I see some of them here. Aubrey's off to Stanford, we'll, 
to see her later this evening, but many of you have succeeded beyond the wildest imagination, uh, and that's really what makes um, our jobs uh, a real pleasure and an inspiration for us. Um, and one of the things that the Buffett uh, funds allow us to do is to bring in the visiting professor. The Buffett visiting professor of this year is Scott Reese. So let me say a few things about Scott. Um, Scott is associate professor of history at Northern Arizona University. So when we hit 80 degrees, Scott thinks it's winter. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but he's still alive after being here for a while. Um, Scott describes himself, and I'll, I'll go with um, some of the information that I have. Um, he's a historian of Islamic Africa with a broad emphasis on comparative history. Comparative is a, is a word that appears a lot. A comparative history aimed at breaking down regional and geographic categories. That's exactly what we try to do in the center, right? Reach across regions, across themes, across fields, across levels. Scott has been doing that his whole life in his research, right? Particular research interest in comparative, there's that word again, comparative Sufism, modern Muslim discourses of reform and the construction of world systems, both in fact and in imagination since 1500. Uh, among the courses he teaches uh, at Arizona, history of Islamic civilizations, Islam in America, uh, approaches to world history, hot button topics, I would say, right? Uh, not hot enough because here at Northwestern he's taught revolution and reform in Islam. Okay, got your work cut out for you there. Um, as well as Islam in the Indian Ocean. A uh, few publications, I won't, won't go, go through the whole list. Uh, Renewers of the Age, Holy Men and Social Discourse in Colonial Benadir, Somalia. Uh, Respectable Citizens of Sheikh Uthman, Religious Discourse, Translocality, and the Construction of Local Context in Colonial Aden. And we'll talk about Aden a little bit more later on. Um, editor of the Transmission of Learning in Islamic Africa, uh, Arab uh, Writings of Somalia, in Arabic Literature in Africa, Volume 3, as well as half a dozen other publications. All right, so it goes on. We have a very successful scholar here. Scott has also been instrumental in working with Thani and Rebecca at the INCEDA program, so he's fit in with many dimensions of what we do here. So it's been a privilege having Scott here. So uh, you haven't come to listen to me, so let me turn it over to Scott, and please join me in welcoming Scott Reese to Northwestern. <laughs> Um, wow, standing room only. I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, good afternoon. Uh, before I begin my talk, I'd like to start out with a few words of thanks. Um, I can't think of any time, actually, in my professional career where I've been as warmly welcomed as, as during my, my time here at Northwestern and the Buffett Center this spring. Uh, from the moment I have arrived, I've, I've been treated not only as a colleague, but, as a, but as a, really as a friend by, by many people who make the center run. Um, and there are so many people, in fact, I could actually spend the next hour just saying thank yous. Um, but there are a few people I'd like to uh, mention in particular. Um, first and foremost, of course, is our, our wonderful patron, Bertie Buffett, um, whose endowment of my position has, has literally made uh, this evening possible. And, of course, I also must extend a word of thanks to Hendrik Sprite, uh, Brian Hansen, and Rita Corian. Um, uh, as well as Francis Lowe, who um, is the, the real power behind the Buffett Center, I think, very often. <laughs> I know, don't let anybody know. <laughs> right? so, um, who, all of whose efforts on my behalf have made this an incredibly pleasant and productive stay, not to mention seamless and easy. Um, I also need to thank uh, my colleagues at the Institute for the Study of Islamic Thought in Africa, Sani Omar, and uh, Rebecca Shrekas, as well as Gianna Moser and all of the staff located at 620 Library Place who have um, just really, really, which is where my office is located, and have been enormously welcoming during the time I've been here. And finally, and in some ways most importantly, I'd like to actually thank the students that I've had the honor of, of teaching this term. Uh, it's, it's really never easy parachuting into a, a new environment to offer a course um, kind of out of the blue where you don't know them and they don't know you and you kind of wonder what's going to happen. Um, but the students I've had this quarter have really risen to the occasion, uh, both graduate and undergraduate, um, being both hardworking and, and really just quite delightful. And I'd like to uh, thank them for the privilege of, of being their teacher this, this term. Um, that said, most of you are here do owe me a paper tomorrow, so keep that in mind. Um, so, um, now, as I move on into my presentation, I'd like to note that the buffer, really echoing some of the things that, that um, Hendrik said a moment ago, 
is that the Buffett Center has been a particularly fruitful intellectual venue for me. Um, my own work, uh, as you've heard Hendrik discuss it and as you'll hear in my own presentation in a few minutes, is very trans-regional in, in focus. As such, it cuts across the traditional boundaries of geographic area studies in an effort to better understand historical phenomena and human relationships that rarely recognize, recognize these arbitrary limits that, that we set on them by, by looking at them and in, in in, uh, privileging the, the notion of the continent. And I found my colleagues at, the, at Buffett, as well as Northwestern more generally, I found in them a very similar mindset that seeks to transcend traditional area studies without losing touch with the many core ideas that made area studies such a revolutionary framework for understanding, for understanding the world we live in. By seeking to move beyond the confines of largely con continental geography, we're able to bring far greater nuance, I think, to our understanding of human interactions and the creation of truly global communities. This is important not only for our own understanding as scholars, I think, but I think it's also enormously, it's an enormously important legacy that we as scholars pass on to our own students as we send them out into an increasingly globalized world. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce you to the leading Muslims of Aden. So I'll begin from here. In a 1922 letter to the first assistant resident of Aden, the chief Qadi, who's actually an Islamic religious judge, of the settlement, a fellow named Daoud al Bata, declared that his friend and colleague on the city's Committee for Pious Endowments, Muhammad Yassin Khan, was a learned and leading Mohammedan of Aden. Now, there are a number of peculiarities surrounding this statement that make it worthy of note. First of all, M.Y. Khan, while certainly learned, was not a member of the local ulama or the religious scholars, but a Bombay-trained lawyer and a serving member of the Indian Civil Service. Second, and even more intriguing, is that neither Khan nor al Bata were actually from Aden. al Bata was originally from Zabid, a town in Yemen's interior known for Sunni religious scholarship, while Khan hailed from the United Provinces in India and had lived in Aden for less than four years, in fact, and, and al Bata had lived there for less than five. Despite this, al Bata had no qualms about declaring their membership in the community of Aden Muslims. And in fact, through the 1920s, Khan played an increasingly important role in the day-to-day -day affairs of Aden's Muslim community, outside of his official duties. Rather than exceptional, such like relations of being Adani were commonplace among the Muslims residing in the port, even for brief periods, and generally went unchallenged by one's co-religionists. In recent years, a great deal has been written about the webs, nodes, and networks that comprise the various European Indian Ocean empires. Most of these works have tended to focus on the political, legal, or economic consequences of empire, with far less attention devoted to the realms of the personal or social, let alone the spiritual. The global connections between Muslims of this period, however, represent an important system of networks that frequently ran parallel to those networks created by empire. For many Muslims, interactions with imperial networks were actually incidental and, and intermittent. Um, for example, those who traveled on European steamships to either further their educations in the lesson circles of Al-Azhar in Cairo or fulfill religious obligations in Mecca. But by this, I don't wish to imply that such brushes with imperial networks were inconsequential but that in terms of influences on the shaping of individual lives, it was interactions with fellow Muslims and not the mechanisms of empire that brought them together that remained the most important. For other Muslims, though, the intersection with imperial networks was not only more, was more, not only more direct, but also very long-term. It brought together individuals and their attendant religious proclivities in novel ways, resulting in the creation of new social realities. While many recent works on the social impact of empire and Islam rightly focus on broad geographic sweeps to understand the extent of Muslim networks in the 19th and 20th centuries, this evening what I want to do is focus on a single locale, the port city of Aden, in order to unpack the ramifications of global Muslim networks on the everyday lives of believers within the context of empire. Now, using the British settlement of Aden, my talk this evening examines the convergence of various, though not necessarily incompatible, individual religious trajectories brought together by the networks of the British imperial state. Through the careers of Muhammad Yassin Khan, Qadi Daoud al-Bata, and others like them, 
it explores how individuals from widely disparate backgrounds created a cohesive community, utilizing the one commonality at their disposal, their faith. Specifically, it explores how religious institutions and spiritual ideas served as parameters for the creation of community and the kinds of symbolic and cultural capital an individual needed to attain influence as a, quote, leading Muslim of Aden within the confines of imperial rule. Now, in a recent series of essays, the historian Frederick Cooper has, ch has challenged historians to reconsider and question many of our common assumptions about the European colonial milieu and re-examine empire as a space, quote, where concepts were not only imposed, but also engaged and contested. In particular, he argues, we spend so much effort constructing models of domination and hegemony, we fre frequently neglect large swaths of local process, giving insufficient weight to the ways in which the colonized, in which the colonized sought to build lives in the crevices of colonial power. Deflecting, appropri uh, deflecting, appropriating, or reinterpreting the teachings and preachings thrust upon them. Now, Cooper argues that, in effect, we systematically lose sight of the dialogues among the colonized themselves, forgetting to ask how people put their thoughts together within the context of their own social and cultural traditions, as well as those constructed and promoted by the colonial state. Cooper's argument can and has been read as a call for a deeper and more nuanced approach to colonial social history. However, his words also are an invitation to explore the construction of place within the imperial context, which is what I intend to do here this evening. <coughs> now, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's become commonplace to approach empire as a complex web of political and economic power. This approach has been helpful in challenging the presumed hegemonic dominance of the imperial center. Or, in the words of two recent scholars, enabling us to think about the inherent relationality of nodal points or centers within an empire and undercut simple metropole binary divide. So that, of course, the traditional notion of empire is that everything is run, or if we're talking about the British Empire, everything is run from London, and people in the, throughout the empire simply follow their marching orders and do as they're told. Whereas the notion of, that scholars are putting forward now is one more of a, of a, ne a network or webs of interaction, where um, the concept of imperial webs are uh, imperial webs of interconnection are used as an analytical framework that allow us to approach empire from a perspective that not only avoids privileging the metropole over the colony, but enables us to envision empire as a dynamic process of multi-directional flows in which not only can metropole impact colony and vice versa, but how colony may impact colony. Until, until now, Historians of Britain's Indian Ocean Empire have focused largely on the political, social, and ideological consequences of the flows created by the state. While important in doing so, they largely ignore networks created by the colonized that also cut across imperial state. Now, several uh, recent works note that in the absence of large settler populations, Britain's empire in the Indian Ocean was actually made possible only through the mass migration of thousands of non-European largely South Asian, soldiers, bureaucrats, merchants, and laborers. By the same token, Thomas Metcalf, a noted historian of Indian notes, that the practice of empire was shaped by structures of government devised in British India. So that, for instance, law and colonial law in East Africa, in Kenya, Zanzibar, and eventually Tanganyika, is actually based on the Euro, the um, European model of law in India. In fact, in the early colonization of East Africa, the uh, legal system that it put in, in place is the Indian Penal Code for a long, great uh, period of time. Now, and uh, Metcalf argues that this left an indelible mark on many of the colonized peoples of the Indian Ocean, while ultimately, quote, creating a sense of Indian nationality among South Asians who participated in the imperial project. Colonial India constituted a critical sub-imperial node that tied Britain's Indian Ocean domain together, and at the same time played a crucial role in creating contemporary Indian national identity. While important works of synthesis 
that provide us with a compelling framework for conceptualizing the totality of Britain's Indian Ocean Empire. These recent studies ultimately leave us with a somewhat incomplete picture, focusing on the Hindu and, to a lesser extent, Sikh experience of empire. Muslims, who constituted a significant portion of the police, military, civil service, and even overseas merchant community, are presumed to fall into the same patterns as their Hindu, Jain, and Sikh colleagues. An examination of the evidence from Aden, however, suggests otherwise. Metcalf contends, for instance, that the overseas colonies outside of South Asia represented a fertile ground for the growth of the Indian for, uh, for the growth of Indian nationalism in general and the Congress Party in particular. Curiously, however, neither Congress, the Muslim League, nor even the Caliphate movement, it was a rather short-lived South Asian movement that sought the uh, restoration of an Islamic caliphate, none of these movements were ever able to gain any ground among the large South Asian community of Aden which was largely, if not wholly, Muslim. The Congress Party's one attempt to establish itself in Aden, for instance, received an apathetic response from local Indians, while the Caliphate movement was met with open derision. Instead, the Muslim South, Asian, uh, the Muslim South Asians of Aden involved themselves far more closely with local issues concerning daily life in the settlement. Concern over the administration of pious endowments, saints' festivals, and the reform of local religious practice that tended to dominate public debate revealed a much greater preoccupation with real and immediate local problems, and reveal much more than any discussion of a more distant and nebulous national con consciousness. This is not to suggest that the large religious and political networks that individuals belonged to were unimportant. However, even in a place as highly mobile as the Port of Aden, attachment and identification with the community of a given place formed as important an element of an individual's social experience as his or her affiliation with any larger social identity. Despite recognition of the fact that the creation of, of the imperial web required the occupation and domination of new spaces, there's actually very su surprisingly little thought given to the creation of place within this context. How do all these Muslims coming together throughout empire, coming into really new communities, recreate these spaces as their own. Two scholars, Lambert and Lester, in their book Colonial Lives Across the British Empire, argue that within the network concept of imperial space, places should not be thought of as simple bounded entities. Rather, they need to be understood as specific juxtapositions of constellations of multiple trajectories, of uh, multiple trajectories of people, objects, texts, and ideas. In short, place, emerges as a result of the convergence of various trajectories, and these are trajectories of individuals, in space and time. If we're to gain any insight into the creation of communities within the web of empire, we need to look not simply at the legal, administrative, and econo economic apparatuses it created, but more importantly, at the lives of individuals and the social frameworks they create. Now, there were probably few spots in Britain's empire where as many intellectual and social trajectories intersected to shape a new community as Aden. When troops of the East India Company occupied the port in 1839, it was home to a modest population of no more than 1,200 residents. By 1849, it had grown to more than 12,000, 19,000 by the 1870s, and nearly 50,000 by the 1930s. And the overwhelming majority of these residents were Muslim. This Muslim community was also one of the most ethnically and confessionally heterogeneous in the empire, including Arabs, Indians, and Somalis, who might variously be Sunni, Shi'i, or Ismaili. As a colonial possession, the administration of Aden was no less eclectic than its population. Now, while the upper echelons of power were always occupied by a select few Europeans, these really rarely numbered more than about a dozen. And in fact, the vast bureaucracy of the station was staffed mainly by non-Europeans, largely Indians and Arabs. In addition to gazetted and non-gazetted officers of the civil service, uh, whose importance could range from sanitation inspectors and patrolmen on the beat uh, to inspectors of police and lower court judges, British administration also depended on the religious elite of the city along with other respectable citizens, and this is in quotes, this is the term they refer to uh, elites such as merchants and um, other low officials they refer to as the respectable Muslims of the city, uh, to oversee various bureaucratic and social needs of the community. 
government-appointed cadis or religious judges, um, for instance, oversaw the registration of marriages and divorces. While the Shams al the literally the son of the learned scholars, um, always the, who was always the leading member of the Idrus family of, um, of Shrifs, were charged with mediating minor civil disputes and overseeing the running of the settlement's numerous cemeteries. Probably the biggest social question facing this disparate body of believers through the 19th and into the 20th century was who or what constituted an Adani. But the question is not only how did one delimit the boundaries of community, of belonging, but how did elites who were, commonly, who were enormously transient lay claim to the moral authority necessary to create these boundaries? While there existed a multiplicity of personal trajectories among the elite Muslims of Aden, faith and the institutions and ideals associated with it provided a common template for the articulation of community and the exercise of power and authority within it. By the early 20th century, there existed two distinct, though intertwined, groups of elite Muslims in what was officially referred to as the Aden Settlement. One consisted of largely secular educated individuals who were either members of the imperial bureaucracy or had some tangential tie to it, such as the children of, of local bureaucrats. The other was made up of traditionally educated religious scholars, merchants, and other notables whose connection to the state and thus their official authority was far more tenuous. Rather than existing in a state of perpetual rivalry, however, we find that these different elites of Aden frequently mixed with one another within the same social and political circles. Several factors may account for the complex relationships we find among the various elites of Aden. First, virtually none of Aden's elites could be described as entrenched or the beneficiaries of any kind of hereditary authority or power. Both secular and traditional elites, with one ex significant exception who I'll mention here in a moment, can best be described as nouveau, with traditions of social authority rarely extending further than a couple of generations into the past. Many influential bureaucrats, such as Yassin Khan, focus of this presentation, had no connection with the city before being posted there. Others, such as Khan's predecessor registrar, a fellow named Sayed Rustam Ali, while born in the settlement, rose to prominence only via the relatively recent, his, his con recent connections with the state. Rustam Ali, for instance, while born in Aden in 1863, is described in the services list as an Indian Mohammedan who joined the residency in what is simply described as a non-gazetted position in 1877 at the, at the uh, ripe old age of 14, and rose to the senior post of registrar, apparently through the dint of his own ambition rather than any kind of family legacy or connections. However, if for lack of a better word, imperial elites could not claim deep roots in the city or impressive intellectual legacies to sustain their claims of authority, neither could most of those associated more closely with the so-called traditional elites. The Sharaf family, for instance, who maintained a monopoly over the judgeship of an outlying suburb known as Sheikh Uthman from the late 1890s uh, through World War II, were the descendants actually of a minor port official rather than a family of religious scholars. The Makawis, a prominent family of landlords, merchants, and notables, um, while producing the occasional religious scholar, owed their power, wealth, and social standing to their rather dubious past as, as imperial fixers um, for the British administration and their uncanny ability to simply make problems go away. Uh, they're very good at this, and this is how they, they get things like night ships eventually. Um, while Daoud al Bata, the other subject of this, this uh, presentation, the Qadi of Crater, was an outsider from Zabid in the Yemeni interior. Although well-educated in the Islamic sciences, he couldn't lay claim to any distinguished family or intellectual genealogy, nor any long-standing connection to Aden. The lone notable exception to the dearth, dearth of familial prestige was the Shams al ulama Sayyid Abdullah al-Adrus. Now, Sayyid Abdullah is virtually alone among Aden's notables, uh, was, was able to convincing, convincingly trace his ancestry to pre-colonial Aden via his ancestor Abu Bakr al-Drus, who died in 1508, and who also happened to be the port's most important local saint. As a result of his genealogy and scholarly bona fides, Sayyid al-Drus was recognized by the British administration as the head or mansab of the Muslim community. Uh, somewhat ironically, though, even though he's the only guy who can have any sort of hereditary claim to authority, um, in the, by the early 20th century, he's the guy who's actually becoming most marginalized 
within uh, local elite circles. So it's these, these new elites who are really um, running the show in the 1920s and 30s. While most of those in Aden having pretensions to social influence and authority might be described as neophytes, they could not be described, however, as parochial. Across the board, the notables of 20th century Aden were well-traveled and intellectually well-read. The registrar Rustam Ali was largely self-educated, who was largely self-educated, owned a large library of both Western and Islamic law books. His successor, Yassin Khan, as I've already noted, was a Bombay-trained lawyer with actually a penchant for quoting Tennyson, um, but, was also, uh, but who also went on the pilgrimage to Mecca on three separate occasions and traveled widely throughout the Hejaz in Western Arabia. At the same time, those on the opposite side of the coin were no less sophisticated, and many of the settlement's religious leaders were well-educated and widely traveled. Um, the leader of the local scriptural reform movement in the 1920s, a fellow named Ahmed al-Abadi, for instance, studied and traveled throughout Persia and South Asia before settling in Aden, while another local reformist, Ahmed al-Isnag, um, was a self-made man who had traveled throughout the Horn of Africa, Egypt, and even to Europe, and wrote at least two books on the necessity of social reform and the virtues of Salafism or scriptural reform. And finally, Dawud al-Bata, while seemingly less traveled than any of these other individuals, appears in the record as a well-read religious scholar conversant with current intellectual trends in the Ummah. Now, the, elites of, the elite Muslims of Aden represented a plethora of personal trajectories with ties to a variety of Islamic intellectual traditions, but they all shared certain commonalities that might draw them together. In particular, education and official, sometimes quasi-official, positions pushed all of these individuals to the forefront of local society. So what I'd like to do now is turn to a detailed examination of some of these complex relationships that evolved between elements of these two parties in the 1920s as part of the re-examining of communal Muslim leadership in the age of high colonialism. In particular, what I want to do is delve into the relationship between the settlement's registrar, Yassin Khan, and Qadi Daoud al-Bata, as well as other notables, as a window onto the ways in which personal trajectories could combine to create a local space. Now, Yassin Khan arrived in Aden in 1918 as a fresh law graduate from the United Provinces to serve as, to serve as uh, quote, temporary extraordinary assistant resident. <laughs> Quite the side. They love the titles. Uh, in 1919, he was named acting registrar, an appointment that was made permanent in 1920. He served for at least 15 years in this position, in addition to a number of secondments as Hajj or pilgrimage officer in the 1920s. As registrar, Khan's primary duties involved acting as a judge of small causes, adjudicating civil cases between plaintiffs uh, valued generally at less than 500 rupees, so things of very small value. Um, during his time in Aden, however, Khan also involved, involved himself in several matters that concerned religious practice rather than civil wrongs. Early in his tenure, a group of notals, notables, led by the Shams al ulama Sharif Aydrus, with the support of the Aden Qadi, Daoud al-Bata, petitioned the resident for official recognition of a committee to, serve the to oversee the administration of properties within the settlement dedicated to the support of various mosques and shrines that through what are known as pious endowments or waqf. So they petitioned the state to establish a waqf committee. In a letter to the resident in February 1921, the notable stated that while there were numerous walk properties in the settlement, the agents charged with overseeing them frequently embezzled the rents um, and neglected the properties to the detriment of body and soul in Aden. As a result, the mosques whose upkeep was supposed to be paid for through those rents, as well as the properties themselves, were in a disgraceful state of repair. If steps were not taken, they wrote, the mosques of Zayden soon would become a danger to the public and to the public health. In an effort to remedy the situation, they wrote, a number of leading citizens of Aden have met and appointed a committee of six persons, with the Shams al-Ulama as chairman to take delivery of these, of these properties to recover the rents and spend the same in, in the interests of the mosques and generally to look after and preserve the mosques and their interests. Now, the British administration formally recognized the committee, but acknowledged that the formation of such a group would, un uh, or they were, uh, pardon me, they refused to formally recognize the committee to give it official sanction, but they also recognized that the formation of such a group would undoubtedly improve the state of sacred sites within the settlement. 
As such, they permitted Registrar Khan to join the group and act in his private capacity as, a, as an advisor to the group. In its first year of operation, the Walk Committee encountered a number of problems in which Khan played a pivotal role, becoming an ardent partisan of the so-called traditional elite, or, as we'll see, at least some of them. Not surprisingly, a number of individuals serving as WAF administrators were not exactly pleased with the formation of a committee or its self-appointed charge. Soon after its creation, the committee began to serve notice on administrators that all WAF property would henceforth be all WAF property rents would henceforth be collected by them. At least two of these agents, a fellow named Ahmed Khayat and Ali Ghalib Norman, refused to cooperate and raised formal objections. Both argued essentially that they'd carried out their char charges faithfully for years and that no self-appointed committee of townsmen had a right to usurp that authority. While encouraged to do so by the residency or on his own initiative, Yassin Khan stepped in as a negotiator for and advisor to the WAF committee, assuring, acceptances as, as, uh, assuring acceptance of their authority in principle over the settlement's WAF property. In a note to the first assistant resident, Khan noted that he and the government had overcome Hayat and Noman's objections by first agreeing to add them to the committee as members, and secondly agreeing that, quote, any dispute relating to the management of, of the endowment properties would be decided amicably by the members, and if this didn't work out, Khan would act as arbitrator in his, quote, unquote, private capacity. They always add this as a phrase, indicating he's not actually, he's not really an official agent of the state, right? You know, he's, he's, he's on his own, you know, this is just him being a good citizen. Um, now, the importance of Khan's role in this matter is twofold. First, from the point of view of the administration, his participation in his private capacity established the legitimacy of the committee and secured their right to collect rents from the walk property. In a memo to the committee a few days later, the assistant resident, a man named Bernard Riley, endorsed the supremacy of the committee over walk property, as well as Khan's place as arbiter of any and all disputes. In addition to securing the committee's legitimacy, Riley's statement, what Riley's statement effectively does is recognize Khan as the walk committee's most influential, if informal, member, as well as making him, in the words of Qadi al Bata, a leading Mohammedan of the settlement. Now, despite the obvious conflicts of interest, Khan is actually allowed to rule on petitions concerning the committee. So, needless to say, this has a chilling effect on complaints. Um, still not satisfied with the results of mediation, for instance, uh, Ali Noman sought redress and brought, the case, brought a case against the committee to the courts for the return of seized walk properties. Backed by the, the, um, by the residency, Khan dismissed the case summarily, noting that the suit had already been decided against Noman, and that while he was sure to appeal, quote, no action was necessary on positions that don't come under any rule of law. It can hardly be seen as coincidental that following Noman's dismissal, there are no further cases brought against the WAC committee um, before the registrar for another 10 years. So he has this chilling effect on any legal action anyone wants to take about the administration of WAC. Now, the aim of those who founded the WAC committee was certainly to exert influence over an important local social institution that could serve to establish their own claims to authority and to speak for the community as a whole. By taking control of the settlement's sacred endowments, at least some of the committee members hoped to extend their authority to include most other sacred spaces in Aden, including mosques and tombs with the goal of making themselves the arbiters of acceptable religious behavior that could be used to define the community. The enthusiastic inclusion of Khan provided the committee with the bureaucratic weight to give their claim to authority real power. At the same time, Khan's official sanction to take an active role on the committee provided him with his own social capital and ability to shape his adopted community. So, but this is really what's important next, is that these guys don't want to stop at controlling WAC. They actually have a plan to control all sacred space within the settlement. Because in it, what happens next is very interesting. In April 1922, Said Abdelai Idrus, remember the, the one guy who has any real claim to social authority, composed an impassioned letter to the residency, denouncing the very committee that he'd helped to form. 
And he accused members of the committee of attempting to expand their authority beyond the simple administration of religious endowments to encompass virtually every aspect of public religious life. The Sayed noted that he had initially given his support to the committee because of the walks, because of the city's many walk properties, and that these had come under control, the control of unsuitable persons who did not properly maintain their trusts. The committee had been formed in a meeting held in his own home and given a charge of one year. Unfortunately, he wrote in his position, after the aforesaid agreed upon period had expired, Muhammad Abdul Qadir Makawi made 27 clauses like a law, which I did not consider to be suitable for the Muslim minds of Aden, because it gave all power of authority over mosques and over their employees to his cousin, Salah Abdullah Khalifa, so that everything connected with the mosque, from the reading of prayers to the dead, to the giving of sermons, could not take place except by his permission. Now, we have to keep in mind the, the two things. First of all, he's absolutely right about this. They, they try to, to gain control all, over all these local institutions. But also, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that his complaint isn't entirely disinterested, as the letter was accompanied by, um, by three separate petitions that he gets people to put forward that all call the resident on the resident to recognize Sayyid Idrus as the chief of all mosques and walk property. So he's not necessarily against uh, there being centralized control. He just doesn't want it to be in the hands of these other guys. Now, ultimately, Al-Banta is identified as the leader of this effort to take control of the town's religious spaces, along with a number of confederates. And the incident reads as an attempt to establish uncontested control over the city's sacred spaces as part of what Idrus implied was their own ideological agenda. What he implies is that these guys are a bunch of scriptural reformists and that they're, they're going to make trouble. Following the Sayyid's own preemptive complaint to the residency, however, al and his followers were forced to abandon their plans and instead found themselves defending the committee. They now controlled against charges of being a disruptive influence. Khan, who had already proved effective in assuring the ascendancy of the Walk Committee, was, not surprisingly, quickly, and one could say rather cynically, pressed into service. The registrar, we're told, composed a letter regarding the legal position of the committee under both Islamic and British law, supporting the actions of al Bata and his supporters. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the actual text of his letter. It seems to have been lost. But, and it's merely referred to by al Bata in his own denunciation of Sharif Abdullah. And from the text of the Qadi's missive, however, it's evident that Khan, rather than being a mere pawn, exerted his own influence over the ideas and rhetoric employed by the Waqf Committee dissenters. And so it's worth uh, quoting uh, a, a piece of the letter. The Qadi wrote, with all due respect, we beg, to, we, we beg to state that we are British subjects and have, according to Mohammedan law, as well as Mohammedan law, as well as the laws of the British government, certain rights which nobody can deprive us of by such threats as the occurrence of a breach of the peace. If this were possible, no one's rights would be safe, and no court of justice can pressure, him, can pressure them for him. The Mohammedan law and the British law, the last of which is the Waqf Act of 1920, provide the necessary facilities for every Mohammedan to ask for an account and for all other particulars relating to the Waqfs, Waqfs formed, uh, by any, and ask any trustee to ask for his removal and the appointment of another trustee if necessary. Now, in the end, neither side wins a clear victory in this encounter. al and his allies were not able to exert control over the mosques and other sacred spaces, but Idrus found himself quietly forced off the committee and out of influence as a result of this incident. However, the real importance of this incident lies in the correspondence and Khan's apparent success in shifting the scope of the legal boundaries used to define the committee. Unlike most correspondence from local religious scholars prior to this, the Qadi's letter did not invoke Muslim custom or religious law, uh, and Sharia was mentioned only as a vague principle and only in concert with British law. Instead, the letter focused on the committee's right to exist under the Walk Back of 1920 and emphasized the rights of all Muslims under the law that are due to all British subjects. Now, al Bata's adoption of this rhetoric was almost certainly opportunistic and should not be seen as a sudden heartfelt recognition of the equality of British civil law with the Holy Sharia. His letter does, however, indicate Khan's success in shifting an important communal boundary 
in which the law of the empire was now accepted as an important tool that could be brought to bear on the public religious lives of the community. The constitution of the Wak community was not, was not Khan's only encounter with religious authority during his tenure. In 1925, Registrar Khan was embroiled, embroiled in another religious controversy. This time, however, he found himself at odds with his ally, Dawud al -Bata. Now, the incident in question here occurred not in the settlement, but on the island of Kamran, which is a barren, godforsaken rock in the middle of the Red Sea um, that was administered by the British at Aden. And the, the incident focused on a proposed extension of the local congregational mosque. Now, Kamaran, as I said, is this, is this rather barren island in the middle of the Red Sea that had been an Ottoman possession until the end of the First World War. And its primary importance was its use as a quarantine station for pilgrims, for pilgrims on their way to the Hajj, um, a use that was actually continued under the British. As a result of its seasonal importance, uh, it maintained a colonial presence that was really much greater than its, its small population and, and remote um, uh, nature would have otherwise warranted, and included a full-time European civil administrator, a sizable police contingent, hospital, and large administrative support staff. Now, what happens is, in July 1924, a wealthy local merchant on the island, a man by the name of Sayyid Muhyiddin Nur Ahmed, applied to the civil administrator for permission to extend the Friday mosque. The civil administrator consulted with the local judge, who indicated that as long as the people of the community did not object, there was no obstacle to the plan. In order to cover his decision, the Qadi also sent a letter to a certain Sayyid Abdulaziz of Hodeida, seeking a fatwa, or a religious opinion, a religious legal opinion on the matter, which was returned in the affirmative. The mosque extension could go forward. In mid-August, however, another wealthy merchant, a man named Tahir Rajab, returned to the island from the mainland and demanded that the work cease. He carried with him three religious opinions, or fatwas, from scholars in the Yemeni coastal town of Hodeida, declaring the work unlawful according to religious law. According to the administrator, before moving to the mainland, Rajab was, had served um, as um, the island's nazir, or, um, or head, and his family retained business interests on Kamran. His opposition to the mosque extension was seen by locals as an effort to undercut the influence of Sayyid Muhyiddin, who was viewed as an up-and-coming rival. Now, work ground to a halt in a meeting of the leading inhabitants was called by the administrator to resolve the matter, but the results were unsatisfactory. So the administrator then decided to embark on a rather, he came with a rather inventive solution here. He decided to embark on a rather peculiar exercise in, in direct democracy. Quote, I then suggested that a secret vote be taken by myself as to what was the true wish of the people which I did yesterday. Both parties agreeing to abide by the result. The question was, do you wish the extension of the mosque? The responses were 43 yes, 107 no, and 18 as the holy law commands. He further noted that many did not express an opinion and I think belonged to the third class. The work halted and apparently going nowhere, the civil administrator wrote back to the residency in Aden to ask if they could, inqu they could inquire about among the learned of Aden, not about whether or not the work could continue, but by whom should the expenses incurred by Sayyid Muhyiddin be borne? Does he get reimbursed for the money he's already spent? Now, the assistant resident, Riley, sent the request to Yassin Khan for his opinion. The registrar, in turn, forwarded the case to his friend Qadi Daoud for the learned man's opinion. And the judge resp responded equally interestingly, by noting that the authorities were, in fact, asking the wrong question. The notion of whether or not Sayyid Mahiyadeen should be reimbursed, as far as he was concerned, was beside the point. The real question from the perspective of religious law was whether or not the extension of the mosque itself was legal. He stated uncategorically that those who opposed the extension and claimed to provide a legal basis for their opinion were, in fact, in error. And the Qadi then embarks on a lengthy explanation of his reasoning grounded in classical Islamic jurisprudence and precedent. And um, this is all in the files. I won't go into it in detail. But it's, it's very much a classical FIC argument. As long as the intentions of the person undertaking the work was to please God, he wrote, and to serve the interests of the people, and the prayer niche in the pulpit were not pulled out of their proper alignments, there could be of no objection to this kind of project. He concluded, 
I concur with the learned men who gave permission for this work, and I have the opinion that it should not be prevented. No attention is to be paid to the majority of voters who have no grounds for their opinions. So he's a direct democracy. No, this is not happening. In his own response, Kahn began by dismissing the Cadi's opinion. He remarked to O'Reilly that he'd asked the judge for his opinion on the matter, but his reply had made no sense. The matter, as far as he was concerned, had already been decided by the votes against Mohiadin. He was building a mosque for his own spiritual benefit and must bear the costs. A mosque is the property of God, he wrote, in the eye of the law, and any money that is spent on extending or repairing it is an act of charity and not recoverable. If Mohiadin had held the position of a trustee and spent money out of the trust funds, then he could be reimbursed, but I presume this is not the case. So this is his final word on the matter. Now, in a striking fit of even-handedness, Riley forwarded both responses to Kamran, uh, pa- effectively passing the buck, as well as a joint third opinion written by, of all people, um, uh, Kadi al Bata and Sharif Idrus, his sworn enemy on the Waqf Committee, um, that reiterated that they were in agreement on this point. So I said, no, this is just a ridiculous argument. And the dispute over the, now, the, dispute over the mosque continued for several months. And in the end, the expansion project was abandoned and Muhyiddin was never reimbursed. Um, but in the local wrangling that followed, the opinions of both the Qadi and the registrar were largely, largely ignored. Now, even though this is something of an anticlimactic case, I think the exchange sheds this light on the complex relationship between Muslim bureaucrats and traditional religious elites in colonial Aden. As we've seen already, largely, secular, largely secularly educated bureaucrats such as Khan and more traditional ulama could work together in order to push a social agenda that both found mutually agreeable, as in the case of the Waqf Committee. At the same time, this was not a relationship without its cleavages. Yassin Khan believed his education and position entitled him to weigh in authoritatively on religious matters and even critique the views of the traditional scholarly class. As we see in the Kamran Mosque dispute, the ulama didn't automatically bow down to his presumed authority, but were quite willing to let him know when he really didn't know what he was talking about. As such, the nature of the relationship between Khan and the local religious elite was one of the almost continuous renegotiation of the boundaries of authority, instrumental in defining the community's moral limits. Such struggles invariably centered on Muslim ideals and institutions, with the various participants drawing on the broader intellectual networks to which they belong. At the time, at the same time, those involved also inevitably drew on the imperial context that formed the other important backdrop of their lives to ensure their lives ultimately intersected. Now, in her book, For Space, an author, uh, a scholar named Doreen Massey, who's actually a geographer, suggests that the construction of place can best be understood as the confluence of trajectories of individuals. And I would suggest that examining the discourses between individuals such as Khan and al helps us construct not only a history of place by way of the trajectories that have brought them together, but also how such trajectories helped shape the ideals of these people that these people ultimately held in common or contested. Placed in a place, we should point out, is not a free-for-all, as both Massey and Lambert and Lester are at pains to point out. Lambert and Lester write, trajectories impose constraints on the material practices that humans adopt in a place and condition the imagination of place. Hence, it should come as a little surprise that not only would Aden's public sphere be defined as inherently Islamic, but that any Muslim seeking to shape the community would have to do so through that rubric. There's simply no other way to have a social impact. The diversity of personal trajectories among the settlement's Muslims, however, meant that the boundaries, <coughs> meant that the boundaries um, and delineating what it meant to be a member and good standing of that community would be a constantly moving target and subject to regular contestation. The public careers of Al-Bata and Khan provided an instructive, provide an instructive window onto how the intersection of two individual trajectories and the individ- intellectual networks they inhabited could shape a local social context. With little in the way of an entrenched elite, Aden offered Khan and al far more opportunity for social and municipal prominence than their brief residency in the settlement might have otherwise afforded. 
Both, in fact, owed much of their influence in local circles to their official position and ties to the administration. If it was the, their connections to official imperial networks that endowed them with authority, it was the religious networks to which these uh, individuals both belonged that caused them to take an interest in the moral fiber of the community and seek to effect change in a particular direction. While both functionaries of the state, both men were ideologically committed to the idea of moral reform in Muslim society. The first, Qadi al Bata, was actually an advocate of scripturalist reform, uh, which we can refer to or sort of gloss here, um, no matter how inaccurately, as Salafism. While the other, Yassin Khan, was now an adherent of a South Asian, um, uh, an adherent of the South Asian Aligarh school of Islamic reform. Curiously, when these two individuals worked in concert, they appeared an almost stoppable force. When opposing one another, they seemed to cancel each other out. Now, it would be very easy to dismiss Khan as an ambitious imperial flunky who's anxious to lord his authority over the locals. However, there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that his interest arose from his own religious convictions and facilitated by the always fuzzy, if not non-existent, line between political, and religious, political, religious, and social authority that existed in most Muslim societies. The registrar was a complex individual who was as much a pious Muslim as a skilled bureaucrat, a fact demonstrated by his journey on the Hajj at least three times during the 1920s. Twice, in 1923 and 24, he was the official uh, imperial pilgrimage officer, so he's there as a representative of the state. But his first experience in 1921 was as a private individual in which he used precious annual leave to undertake the trip. His official, report on the pilgr his official reports on the pilgrimage are suffused with both a paternalistic concern for what he regards as the superstition and ignorance of the average believer and the desire, indeed the duty, to fix the faith through a combination of rationality and technical progress. Within this context, his involvement in various public religious issues can be read as a genuine desire to improve the lives of local believers through reforms that he derived, that derived from what he viewed, pardon me, as his own enlightenment-informed principles. So that, for instance, the bureaucratization of walk and the introduction of limited democratic principles. He sees as things that are important to reviving and reforming uh, Islam Muslim society. Khan, it could be argued, wished to use his official position to improve the spiritual and social lives of his fellow believers. As such, his thought and actions shared a great deal with what has become known as the Oligar School uh, of, of Islamic Reform, a movement rooted in, in, in India and associated with Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, who's no relation, by the way, um, that championed scientific progress as the remedy for the faith's 19th century malaise. As a trained religious scholar, El Bata's interest in local moral affairs was also hardly surprising. Like Khan, the Qadi's activities outside of the Waqf Committee reveal a good deal about his own ideological leanings. And in fact, he becomes very involved in a number of um, scripturalist reform movements that are aimed at, at trying to purify the um, local popular uh, faith in terms of uh, he, wants, he joins a movement to ban various spirit possession cults and to limit what he considers the immoral activities that go on in various saints festivals. Um, now, as each had a clear concern for the moral well-being of their fellow believers, the trajectories of Khan and al-Bata and other religious notables, notables naturally intersected because both these individuals are interested in the moral fiber of the community. It's not surprising that they intersect with one another. The co their cooperation resulted in the shaping of at least one communal norm, with the shift of walk property from private management by individuals to corporate communal control, although their larger role of co central control over religious institutions seems to have been frustrated. The inclusion of Khan, however, also caused other unanticipated, sh unanticipated shifts in the boundaries of local practice. Thus, in their ill-fated attempt to take control over all Islamic institutions, al Bata and his allies ended up acknowledging that imperial law could be recognized as virtually equal to religious law. Also, certainly a ploy on the part of the judge, the citing of, of imperial law as a ruling norm of society represented a novel avenue for bolstering religious and communal authority through one's subjecthood. Um, we are subjects of the British Empire. We have certain rights, and those include religious rights. 
However, as we saw in the example of the incident in Qumran, Khan's influence was hardly a foregone conclusion. While certain boundaries could be shifted, others could not. When Khan attempted to appropriate the right to interpret religious law, applying his own Aligarh-inspired principles, the reaction was swift and unequivocal. In order to check the ambitious thrust of, a some, of his sometime ally, al Bata pushed back with all the weight of Islamic learning to blunt the move. While neither side seemed to prevail in an official sense, Khan never attempted to usurp religious authority on his own again. Most of the recent research on Islamic reform in the 19th century and 19th and 20th centuries is increasingly transregional in scope. This work, this presentation this evening, adds a great deal to our understanding of reformist discourses and their interconnected nature, rendering more ra rendered more rapid and profound by the development of regular steam travel and cheap lithographic print within imperial domains. Now, most of this research up to this point, however, is focused on the highest levels of discourse and remained firmly fixed on discussions between reformist intellectuals. Little space has been devoted to examining the impact of such intellectual networks on individual communities and the lives of believers. And my presentation this evening has focused on the very visible effects of trans-regional Muslim <coughs> networks in the imperial period on a particular community. From the early 1900s through the 1930s, we find numerous examples of individuals calling for changes in ritual, belief, and conduct in Aden, inspired by reformist discourses from across the community of believers. These include, include strict scriptural reformists, and, as well as their opponents, and what we might call, for lack of a better term, religious modernizers, such as those of the oligarch school. All of these ideological groups were connected to larger intellectual networks via, via the webs of interaction created by empire. So that all these individuals holding these opinions in Aden, while acting on the ground in Aden, are actually also tied to much broader intellectual networks in this period. They're not making these things up for themselves. Within the confines of Aden, they frequently came together, though, as an ever-shifting constellation of alliances and antagonisms based partly on individual self-interest, but also on coinciding beliefs to shape the community at large. The case of Khan and al Bata can be read as part of this much larger social and religious pattern of reform within the imperial context in the early 20th century. The personal trajectories of Khan and al Bata point both men in what can be viewed as divergent, though not wholly incompatible directions. Khan was an urbane, dedicated Indian civil servant who ultimately saw westernizing trends as the savior of the faith. al Bata was a traditionally trained Arab religious scholar from a far more provincial background who, not surprisingly, found a more scripturalist school of reform appealing. When the networks of imperial service caused their paths to cross, ripples and shifts resulted within the framework of public, public religiosity in Aden. In the end, the imperial record preserved preserved an image of these currents that allows us to paraphrase Cooper, paraphrase Cooper to see at least part of the lives within the communal crevices creating, created by the colonial moment. Through the lives and actions of these individuals, we see how the global networks of age coalesced into a community of everyday lives. Thank you. We take about 20 minutes, maybe, of questions, and then I don't want to stand between you and drinks in the band, so we'll, <laughs> we'll stop around 6.30. Uh, so if you raise your hand, Scott will uh, field your questions. Tim? Thank you very much for your talk. The question that I had was regarding um, what you were speaking about, these attributes of Aiden, such as what I think you call these uh, networks of communication, these webs of communication, and the lack of a sort of entrenched um, leadership in the... Um, colonial administration, would you say that these are attributes that are just unique to Aden, or would you say that they can be set a model for applying your kind of research to other imperial centers? Yeah, I think very much, very much the latter. I, I think you you find these intersections um, wherever empire is bringing people together, and that pretty much occurs with any within any community. And I think one thing that we've tended to, as I said in the in the talk, one thing we tend to focus far too much on is is simply the official record, and that we we find, and this research is based primarily on uh, residency records, uh, but the other thing we, we have are um, the production of local material. 
and the production of local tracts and newspapers where these things are being discussed as well. In addition, um, you know, with, with the evolution of steam travel and cheap print, which I refer to, um, there's an enormous um, influx of uh, reading material, in particular newspapers that people are, are reading constantly. So that you find throughout Britain's Indian Ocean Empire, for example, pe people reading the same newspapers that come from Cairo or from Beirut. So that all of these ideas are out there floating around uh, but, uh, and, and, and coming together. But I, th I think the important thing to take away from this is all these ideas are, are floating around out there in the ether across the imperial networks. But I think what we have to keep in mind is that their impact on the local level is always unique. It's always interpreted in new ways to fit in with the local, con to um, be reconciled with the local context. So I think that's what we need to keep in mind, is that as, as, a, as a generic model, I think it is um, one that we can use for looking at imperial nodes and the lives of, of the colonized. But the other thing we have to keep sight of is that it's not always going to play out the same way. It reminds me enormously my own great grandfather, uh, my Quaker great grandfather, who was born in Yorkshire, uh, raised in Cork, went to university, the Queen's University, the Free University, was created by the Empire, uh, and so forth. Went back and, and, and forth in, in, into England, and finally wind, winds up in America, uh, and uh, so appalled by the state of uh, bookkeeping here that he becomes the first CPA in the state of Missouri. Uh, <laughs> the, bouncing all over the place so easily and so comfortably uh, because of the language and, 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 and because of the non-need of the passports and all, uh, all that sort of thing, and finding, uh, and, and finding religious communities in each mm -hmm. place uh, as he's working for these various banks. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think this is something we can think about with, with regard to a lot of places. I hadn't really thought of the American example, but, but in a lot of ways it's, it's, it's very much representative of, of this era in the second half of the 19th century where mobility becomes much more common and it's much more rapid. Now, with regard to the Indian Ocean, as I said, a lot of these movements for people are often rather temporary and ephemeral. Um, so, for example, um, the traffic on the annual pilgrimage, the Hajj, explodes exponentially in the second half of the 19th century. Um, and it does have a huge impact on the movement of intellectual discourses, say, from uh, Western Arabia and the Hejaz to Indonesia for example, because you have more and more, especially Indonesians, going on, on the Hajj. But I think we have to keep in mind is that those movements are temporary. Whereas what we're looking at in Aden are movements that are much longer term, are about like settling, are about like immigrating, in fact. Um, Khan eventually leaves uh, imperial service and becomes a local businessman. He, uh, starts, he, he, he starts the local chamber of commerce in the 1950s, in fact. Uh, so, so he really does, the place kind of grows on him. He, he doesn't leave. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I think that we can see this model at work in a lot of places. Oh, I th yeah, I think it's very pragmatic. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Normally, we don't put these guys in the same room. Um, you know, a guy who's associated with Aligarh, which is very, very dominated by notions of, of the enlightenment, of rationality and a scientific approach to the faith virtue versus scriptural reformists who want to go back to the roots of the faith. Um, these guys very often have little in common and, and spend a lot of time sniping at one another um, in... Uh, thing in places like the press at a higher discursive level. But here I think what we see is that, you know, local conditions make for strange bedfellows. And it's not always a comfortable relationship either, but they, they see a common goal, which is uh, the, the moral fiber of the community and the moral well-being of the community. So that they're quite willing to, to cooperate with one another. Although as we also see, and this is why I, I apologize for the paper being a bit long, but the, the Cameron example is very important because this is a cooperation that has its limits. Um, at some point, 
the the local ulama just say, you know, hold on there, slick. You know, you're just not going any further. This is this is not on. Um, you have to go by religious precedent and, and these 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 notions of direct democracy, where there's there's not a whole lot of it, respect for the the masses, as it were, um, really rub them the wrong way. Yeah, this is this is a curious. Uh, that's a good question, and it, it's it's a curious one to try to answer in the context of Aden. Um, first of all, there aren't a lot of Zaidis. Zaidi as uh, Shias are um, these are these are people who um, recognize the preeminence of, of Ali as the Imam um, versus Sunnis who who do not. Just very quickly, um, and Zaidis are a particular form of Yemeni Shi. Now, curiously, they're not very well represented in Aden. They're mainly way up in the Highland North and don't migrate into Aden. The, the Shi that you do find in Aden are mainly 12 or South Asians, sort of more mainstream, uh, the, the, the kind of Shiism that's practiced in, in Iran. And it's, it's curious, we, you know, the local people, when you, when you read local, dis, uh, local material that's published, um, very little is made of these differences, oftentimes. And in fact, you find uh, Sunnis and Shi'is patronizing the same tombs, for example. So, and, and I still haven't been able to really answer in a satisfactory way what are the cleavages between Sunnis and Shi in this period. Uh, we're ta- when I'm talking about these guys on the walk committee, yeah, I'm, I am talking about Sunnis strictly. Um, the Bora Ismailis have their own walk, walk committee, um, and there's, there's n- I haven't actually found any evidence yet of a, of a 12-er Shi committee. Um, but just in terms of, of how the communities interact, there, there seems to be a great deal of fluidity. They're, they're not compartmentalized from one another um, very much, and it, it's, it's, it's very curious as well. So I hope that answers your question, Kaya. Um, so I can see what you just said about Khan being um, not an imperial actor, but actually using some of the empire's resources again from the traditional elites. Right? And at the same time, I can also see that as counter um, to his interests. But at some point, the, the traditional elites might say, hey, you're an imperial actor. You've sold out to take these British resources, these, these governmental positions, and you talk reform, but actually you sold out to the West. Right? So, a, do you see that counter discourse against these guys, these new elites? Um, do you see that traditional discourse come out and say, well, you sold out? And secondly, how do these local guys actually manage to straddle the fence? So using British resources against these traditional elites uh, and still managing to use these resources for their own purposes without uh, sort of losing traction, if you will, on the ground? Um, well, that was more like three questions, Henry. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, about whether or not these guys are regarded as, as sellouts. Um, not by the traditional ulama. The traditional ulama regard these guys as a resource who, who can be useful and who have their limits and occasionally have to have the brakes put on them. But, but you know, elites are elites and they, they see them as useful. Now, there are other elites in Aden, particularly um, individuals who are locally born who have similar secular educations, um, who are much more entranced by anti-colonial, growing anti-colonial rhetoric, certainly by the 1930s, who do regard these guys, guys like Khan, as sellouts and won't deal with them. But that, that's even another layer beyond that. So the traditional ulama, not, not so much. They don't tend to see it in such black and white terms. It's more about, um, well, in some cases, we're allied with one another and you're useful, but there are other instances where um, 
you know, we're in opposition to one another. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, losing traction, I mean, you know, whatever authority they exercise, they only have because the British state allows them to. So um, they're, especially in a place like Aden, which is enormously small and has incredibly transient populations, so it's, it's very hard to get a groundswell of support behind you. Um, so I think, I don't know whether I'm, I'm answering your question here uh, fully, but I, I, I tend to think that, you know, what, whatever they can get out of the, the state is often because the state um, decides to allow them to do it. Does that answer your, I'm not sure I'm really answering your, your question. It's a complicated game. Right? The British Empire wants local elites who can deliver the goods in some ways. You yeah. want somebody who has traction and can do something. Yeah. At the same time, the local elites have to make a choice between do I get too close to the British and I'm considered a seller, but I do want to use some of the British resources for my own. Yeah, and that, well, oh, so what you're really talking about here is blowback from being too closely associated yeah. with the yeah. state. And, and you know, that, that doesn't really seem to happen. Sharif Idrus, who I spoke about a little bit, does become marginalized in this period, but it's, it's largely because he is seen, and not because he's seen as a lackey of the British, but because he's, he's perceived as out of step with um, reformist discourse. And so he sort of loses respect and loses ground among the other elites because he is, um, his authority is really based on his connection with the tomb, and these guys are very suspect of tombs. And his, his authority is often based on, his, his power is often based on uh, a great deal of, um, of traditional authority among the wider population, and, which is based on um, approving of uh, local ritual and local practice that these guys oppose. So his actual power is the one that slips, but not because of his associations with the state. It's simply because he's intellectually out of step and out of sync with the more powerful currents. The other thing to keep in mind about these guys is that many of them have, and this is a, yet another layer to this, um, have bankrolls that are not attached to the state whatsoever. They come from merchants in India. Uh, there's one guy, uh, another set of people I could talk about this evening are these scripturalist reformers who um, are trying to clean up what they regard as the immoral streets of Aden and by, um, they run anti-prostitution campaigns, anti-spirit possession campaigns, etc. But all their money comes from guys with very deep pockets in Bombay, in fact. So that, that authority is really linked not so much to the state, but to have an in with somebody who can who can fund you, a patron. Uh, yeah, thanks for your yeah. talk. My question was along these lines of um, overlapping public spheres uh, and overlapping religious spheres. I'm curious about language and what you found about um, the different uh, discourses, uh, the languages in which these religious discourses are, are put forth in Aden. Um, we know at this time The, the, um, the linguistic sphere certainly privileges Arabic and English when it's useful. So that English is really used as a language of communication with the state in this period. Um, so that, in fact, Arabic is so dominant, you will find Arabic um, uh, petitions written to the state in Arabic signed in Gujarati because they're Indians who are writing in Arabic, but are actually Gujarati speakers. So actually, they have a, a, um, a, 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 a local amunshi, uh, a, a court writer, write the petition for them in Arabic, and then they sign it in Gujarati. Um, the only time you see English really being used is somebody like Khan who privileges it and uses it. Um, now, that starts to change actually not in this period, in the 20s and 30s, but in the 1950s 
when you have the emergence of something called the Aden Chronicle, which is a, an English language weekly that appears in Aden uh, from about 1950. And curiously enough, is really written by, by Aiden elites for other Aiden elites. And it's a way for people to talk about ideas, particularly of secularism, of westernization, um, especially in a political realm, um, while deliberately excluding some people from that conversation because you don't want them to know what you're talking about. And so it becomes kind of this public yet private medium for people to use. But, but in this period, Arabic is certainly as ascendant. I think there was one more question back there. Should we take one question and then we'll talk? It was actually the same question, just a, uh, maybe a slightly different emphasis. Um, in terms of religious scholarship, was Arabic sort of definitive and Well, I wouldn't say that, it's, that you have nothing to say. This is it's actually a very good question, and it, it relates to Nate's question about um, authority. It's uh, writing in Arabic is what provides you with a certain level of legitimacy, with an ability to demonstrate that you are a, a, a learned, civilized, pious individual. And the curious thing about this is that it does uh, occur within the imperial context. So even as an imperial subject, it's not English that becomes the important language of demonstrating your um, social authority, it, it, it remains Arabic. And in fact, and as I said, you don't actually have to be an Arabic native speaker to use it. Um, you have examples of plenty of Indians, of plenty of South Asians who, who do the same. And it, it's, it's clearly aimed at establishing a certain level of legitimacy. I know we have undergrads here. We're on the honor system, so uh, yes. the people are less than 21. It's a lot back for me, but I'll be joining you. Thank you.